Stuff. Today we're talking about the principle of the harvest, the gospel, and generosity. So let me read this text for you from the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians, and then we'll uh, get into our subject for today. He writes, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made, you will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Let me... Um, you actually got a two for today. I heard this story a long time ago. Uh, two guys shipwrecked on a deserted island. One is distraught, uh, starts uh, immediately trying to gather sticks to build a fire so that he can send off a, uh, a signals to maybe get rescued by someone. Uh, the other one is very calm and relaxed, just sitting on the sand looking out at the ocean. The distraught guy says to the calm guy, how can you just sit there? Don't you know we could die on this island? The calm guy says, I'm not worried. He goes, why not? I give 50% of my income to my church. The other guy's just dumbfounded and kind of angry. He goes, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. You think God's going to rescue you because you give money to your church? The guy says, no, but I know my pastor will find me, he says. <laughs> I know many people get a little nervous when pastors start talking about money. First, because money in general makes us a little bit nervous. That has to do with the role money plays in our lives and with the power money has. Talked a bit about that last week. And second, because... Uh, people like me, pastors are always asking for it. At least that's the perception. And like I said last week, guys like me, pastors uh, make a huge mistake in allowing people to think that giving or generosity is about the church uh, because it's not. The other mistake guys like me have made for decades is allowing guys like you to think that there's a difference between what you do for work and what I do for work. That there's a difference in importance to God between your work and my work. There is no difference. So all season long we've been saying that your work and my work are, all about, uh, is, are equally about God. God is in our work, behind our work, calls us to our work, and is uh, honored by our work. And others are blessed through our work. Today I want to add to that and teach you and talk about how generosity is not about the church. Rather, generosity is all about God. So the first thing we're talking about today is God is generous. God is generous. A big debate recently, uh, I forget what day it was, between uh, the creationist guy named Ken Ham and an evolutionist guy named Bill Nye. Uh, Ken, ha Ken Ham happens to be a young earth creationist. Uh, I didn't see the debate. I read a little bit about it, and it didn't go so well for him, I don't think. I personally lean on the old uh, earth creation side of things, but very much on the creation side of things. I think the argument goes much better in that case. Anyway, there's a big debate about that. Uh, but a few, uh, every so often I get a question uh, uh, that goes something like this. Hey, Pastor Brian, what about the dinosaurs? And I'll say, excuse me, what about the dinosaurs? If these incredible creatures roam the earth, why doesn't the Bible talk about them more? It's a good question. And usually I say, well, if you look closely, I think you can make an argument that they are in the Bible. For example, in Job chapter 40, verse 15, we read, and Job, by the way, is one of the oldest books in the Bible chronologically. It says, look at the behemoth. There's a unique Hebrew word there translated behemoth or Leviathan, uh, which I made along with you, which feeds on grass like an ox. What strength he has in his loins, what power in the muscles of his belly. His tail sways like a cedar. His bones are tubes of bronze and his limbs like rods of iron. Okay, sounds like some huge beast that God has created. Who knows? Maybe that is a dinosaur. We don't know. Okay, then they say, well, if God wasn't going to make a big deal of them, and if human beings and dinosaurs never shared life together on this planet, now some think they did, some think they didn't, uh, why did he create them at all? I had that question actually at the East Campus one day a few years ago, and I didn't really have a great answer for it, so I just off the top of my head said, well, I think kind of for fun. I think God kind of created them for fun. For the same reason you created giraffes and kangaroos and some people, just for fun, Right? Just so we would know his infinite creativity. You ever watch one of those Animal Planet shows at night when your kids are watching, you, they leave it on, you're watching Animal Planet? We do every now and then, and they have this, this, this incredible photography. Don't know how they get it, of these wild creatures. And after 10,000 years of hum human civilization, we're still discovering creatures we've never seen before that have lived on the earth all this time, bottom of the sea, top of the mountains. There's this infinite variety of wildlife and creatures to show God's infinite creativity. I think maybe God made the dinosaurs so that one day human beings created in his image with intelligence and curiosity would start asking questions about where we came from. How did everything get here? We'd start digging around in the dirt and we'd find who made this? Who made this thing? And we know something about the God who is infinitely creative. See, I think creation itself is an act of generosity. I saw um, 
on my Twitter feed, my boys got me into this thing called Uber Facts, and it's got a lot of useless information, and who knows whether all of it's true or not. But there was an Uber Fact on the universe. It said, if you divided all the stars of the universe equally between everyone living on Earth right now, we would all own 4.2 trillion stars. The infinite creativity of the God of the universe. I believe the universe itself is an expression of the extravagant generosity of the creator. The, the entire universe exists in order to make human life possible. It's what some call the anthropic principle. The universe appears to be finely tuned for our existence. And beyond that, in Genesis we read that after creation, God gives Adam everything he needs. He gives him his own image. We talked about that earlier this season. Created Adam in his own image. He gave him the breath of life, made him a living soul. He gave him a garden to live in. He gave him a work to do. And then he gave him a partner for life, woman, like him, but so very much not like him. Then he gives both Adam and Eve everything they need for life. And then the serpent comes along and convinces them that they need just a little bit more. And then sin comes into the world, and the rest of the story of the Bible is about the gospel. Then he gives Abraham a promise. He says, I'll make you into a great nation. I will bless all the world through you. Then he gives his people deliverance from their enemies, the exodus from Egypt. Then he gives his people his own presence, the cloud of smoke by day, the pillar of fire by night. Then he gives them food in the desert, manna in the morning, and then quail later after that. Then he gives them his word in the form of his, of his law, the Ten Commandments. Then he gives them the prophets to remind them consistently of his word and his desires for them. Then fast forward to the New Testament, which is all about God. God's greatest gift to the world. John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. So whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave. From beginning to end, the Bible presents God as generous. Interesting how many people in our world today do not think of God as generous. Think of him as lots of things, but not necessarily as generous. But the very heart of the gospel is the generosity of God. And that leads us to the second point today. The gospel is always a gift. The gospel itself is always a gift. Remember uh, Phil's faith story from a few weeks ago when he showed that video? How he talked about he was into sex, drugs, and rock and roll as a lifestyle up into his 20s. Finally, as his life was headed south, uh, his family was breaking apart. He was uh, addicted to alcohol and drugs. He sat still, let a preacher explain the gospel to him, and he realized that it took the blood of God, that's his language, took the blood of God to forgive his sins, which were many, he said. And then he said this, it seemed like a mighty kind thing to do for someone who was a scumbag like me. It seemed like a mighty kind thing for someone to do for a scumbag like me. He understood what Romans chapter 6 says. Paul writes, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, there's the generosity again, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sin is sin. And again, that word is, uh, you're not supposed to use it out there in the world today because it's a dirty word. But sin is sin because it kills everything it touches. Sin kills everything it touches, eventually. It kills relationships. It kills uh, our relationship with God. Eventually, it kills our souls. And eventually, it takes our life spiritually and physically. Sin kills everything it touches. But, and because of our sin, uh, we deserve judgment. But God gives something else. He gives through his own generosity, eternal life, through forgiveness of sin. And forgiveness is never deserved. It's one of the things we get wrong about forgiveness. I was talking to somebody about that just the other day. We, we tend to think people need to earn our forgiveness. We struggle to forgive because we think people need to deserve it. Well, forgiveness is never deserved, ever. Forgiveness is always a gift. In Ephesians 2.8, the Apostle Paul, who once was Saul of Tarsus, trying to kill followers of Christ, says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. It's by grace you've been saved. See, the gospel turns religion upside down. Religion says, do good, go to church, keep the rules, don't kill anybody and hope that at the end of the day, at the end of your life, the good outweighs the bad and you're in. That's religion. But that's not the gospel. That's closer to Islam. Islam teaches the five pillars of the faith. One, there is no God but Allah. Two, prayer five times a day. Three, give alms. The Muslim is required to give 2.5% of their savings uh, to the poor. Uh, th uh, four, the fast of Ramadan every year. And five, make a pilgrimage to Mecca at some point in your lifetime. If a, a good Islamic person does all five of those things, they have a chance 
to achieve whatever they call salvation uh, with, with Allah. But that's not the gospel. The gospel says you can't be good enough. You can't do enough. You can't build your own stairway to heaven. But God did what we cannot do. God came down and Jesus died in our place, offers us salvation, not by religion, but by grace. It's a gift and you can only receive it, receive it by faith. That's the gospel. How? How do we receive the gift? Romans 10, 9 and 10 says it this way. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Believe in your heart, say it with your mouth. And then out of gratitude, live it out in your life. It flips, the gospel flips religion upside down. Which leads us to the third point, which is the gospel always then produces generosity. The gospel always produces generosity. Long time ago, summer of 1982... Uh, I did a ministry internship in Pittsburgh. I was just considering God's call in my life at that point. It was a long time ago. I uh, hadn't yet been to seminary or anything. My dad had a pastor friend of his in uh, inner city Pittsburgh, offered me a seven-week internship. Uh, no money. I think I got $25 a week or something like that. Lived in the church just to help out anywhere I could. So I took it. Spent the summer working in inner city Pittsburgh. And basically he assigned me to this uh, community of refugee people that was living in Pittsburgh at the time uh, from... Um, they were called the Hmong people from Laos. And uh, they had been, they'd come over uh, in the aftermath of the Vietnam War and communism and the Khmer Rouge and all that sort of stuff. Um, and they were living in inner city Pittsburgh. And so he said he wanted me just to kind of hang out with these kids, get to know them, kind of form a little youth ministry for 15 or 20 Hmong teenagers. So that's what I did. I got to know these kids. And um, for the first time in my life, I was exposed to what I would call real poverty. Uh, they had come to this country. Uh, they were living in tenement housing in the slums of inner city Pittsburgh, just across a, a city park from where the church was. And as I got into some of their apartments, the, mo the mothers would tell me that the cockroaches were so bad in the apartments, they made a difference in their food supply. The cockroaches ate enough bread uh, that they could measure how much more it cost them to buy extra bread. You, and you could see they would eat through whole halves of bread in a day or two. Uh, just a kind of poverty you could smell and, and just being around. And so they went from war to that sort of life and to uh, extreme poverty. To earn money, uh, the women and the kids would spend the night times digging up night crawlers. At nighttime, I'd go to bed, I'd look out my window. The first couple of nights there, I'd see these lights bobbing up and down in the park across the street. Like, I don't know what, giant fireflies, I don't know what they were. So I went out one night and I found them. They were the moms and the kids with flashlights going along the park and digging up night crawlers and putting them into gallon jug, gal, empty gallon milk jugs. Because they had discovered that down at the rivers, uh, down in, in Pittsburgh, because there's three rivers that go through Pittsburgh, they could sell them for bait at the docks. Seven dollars for a gallon of uh, night crawlers. That's what they would do to earn extra money. Uh, so I got to know these kids. Uh, one of the boys I got to know was a, a boy, a 14-year-old boy named Neng. And Neng was a problem. He was angry. He was immature. Uh, he uh, was unruly. He would, he, but he always came around needed attention. He would shout out profanity just to, just to tr get attention. I mean, it was really hard to have him around for the first few weeks. But I slowly got to know his story. Found out that when Neng was 12 years old uh, in his homeland, he saw his father um, shot to death in front of their uh, small home by the, by the communist rebels. Uh, and then when he was 12, later than that, uh, with his family, he had to swim across the Mekong River being shot at by soldiers uh, to, to escape and get into freedom. He, the swim was so difficult, he was coughing up blood out of his mouth at the age of 12. Uh, but they made it. And I thought when I was 12, I was playing Little League Baseball. You know, our lives were just so different. So I started to understand something about why he was the way he was. And slowly got to know him. Slowly he calmed down. Slowly he began to trust me. And we built this relationship. Well, at the, fast forward to seven weeks later, the last night I was going to be there and I was going to go on with my life, go back to my home and do other stuff, go back to grad school and so forth. I was leaving. So we had a little party, had ice cream. I think we went to a movie or something, had some ice cream uh, at the church. And then uh, all the kids left and I went up to pack my stuff. Uh, about an hour or so after I went up to my room to pack my stuff, I heard... Uh, a voice shouting at the bottom of the, out in the parking lot of the church. I looked out and it was Neng. He had his little stingray bike, his hat on backwards, and he was, he was shouting at, at me to come down. So I went down and there, uh, he, as I got down there, he said, he was nervous and kind of embarrassed. He took an envelope out of his pocket. He said, he said, Brian, this is for you. He said, maybe you buy some food. And then he got on his bike and rode away. And I took, I held the envelope for a minute and I had a sense for what was in it. And I was afraid to open it. When I opened it up, there was a $10 bill in there. He gave me a gift of $10 and 
And it touched me because I knew what it took for him to earn that $10. All those light nights of light and, and collecting those, those worms at night. I gave a few weeks of my time. Just a few weeks of my time. And then I was going to go on with my life. But this young Hmong boy, coming from where he came from, gave me a gift I never forgot. $10. Might as well have been 10000 It's been 34, 32 years, and I still can't forget that gift and the impact it made. What is generosity? Generosity is a form of gratitude. Generosity is a form of love. The best definition I've ever come up with is freedom from smallness of heart. The gospel produces generosity, and generosity produces more generosity. Let me read these, this text again so you hear it in context. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, he who gives us everything we need, will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. The Bible's trying to teach us that God's generosity is intended to create generosity in us. Yes, with our money, but much more than that, with our time. And the older I get, that's more difficult than money sometimes. With our money, with our time, with our talents, and with our hearts. Not just in church, but in, in our work and in our homes. Generosity then leads people toward God. Generosity by itself leads people toward God. Paul says you will be made rich in every way so you can be generous on every occasion. Money, time, talent, heart. And through us, your generosity, watch, will result in thanksgiving to God. Here's the questions I want you to deal with around the table today. First, who have you known in your life who was truly generous? And how did that person display generosity? We've all had the blessing of knowing someone who just had a generous spirit about them. Uh, find that person in your life, talk about what they were like and why. Secondly, list five examples of God's generosity to you that you often or maybe always take for granted. Find five examples of God's generosity to you that you tend to take for granted. And third, in which area do you find it most difficult to be generous and why? Money, with your time, or with your heart? See if you get that far in your discussion. I'll wrap you up right before 7 o'clock.